Let us pray. Our precious Father, we want to thank you again for our gathering this evening uh, to begin our prayer conference, focusing on prayer. We trust you, merciful Father, that you will teach us and help us to hear and understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the prayer ministry is having this prayer conference today and Sunday. And the theme of this conference is wonderful. It says, focusing on things above in prayer. And then the theme text of this conference is Colossians 3 verse 1. And verse 2, I added 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. The summary of all of this I read and this theme is seek the will of God in prayer. That's the summary of all of this. So don't seek your own selfish will in prayer. That's what this summarizes. So, but to, to, to start it off, we're going to talk about praying a right and not a miss, which really connects to what we said now, praying the will of God in prayer. <clears throat> because if you are seeking those things that is above, Jesus said, yeah, we'll be done in heaven, on earth as it's done in heaven. So, praying a right and not a miss is the topic. And our text is James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask a miss that you may spend it on your pleasure. So you see that the purpose of prayer is not to get things to spend on your personal pleasure. Because when you do that, you are not seeking things above. You are not seeking the will of God. The purpose of prayer is to establish the will of God on earth. That will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. We pray amiss when we focus on our own pleasure and our own will. And number two is that we need to understand the need to pray, really. We need to understand the need to pray. Genesis 1, 2 reveals to us the importance of prayer. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Here we see very important need to pray. When you pray, you generate the power of the Spirit. The, Spirit. the power of the Spirit was hovering, hovering, and nothing happened until the Word of God came. The Spirit and the Word come together to produce divine miracles. The Spirit and the Word. God says, I watch over my Word to perform it. It is the performance of the Word by the Holy Spirit that brings the word into reality. So when we pray, we generate the power of the Spirit of God. And when we pray the will of God, the word of God comes like to it, and then a miracle takes place. That's why you can't bring another word, because the Holy Spirit cannot act on it. So in um, James 5, 16, confess to one another, therefore your faults, your, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart, the honest, that's what I'm heading, the honest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. So when you pray, you make power available. Now, if, if, if the word that you are bringing is not the word of God that God speaks, the Holy Spirit can perform it. So that's why prayer is not to establish our own will and our own words. It's to establish the will of God, the word of God. So when you study and have revelations, you generate the word. You generate revelation. You generate the truth in your heart. And this word is what the Holy Spirit will execute. When you take this word to God in prayer, we are going to understand this thing better when we go further down. When you take this word to God in prayer, the Holy Spirit is it like the Spirit of God is hovering and God spoke. Now when you pray, it starts hovering because you are generating the power 
But when you speak the word of God, at that same moment, the Holy Spirit begins to do it like this. God said, let there be light. And there was light. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will and they shall be done unto you. My words is what you pre- preach. I mean, you pray. My words. When my words come out of your mouth, the Holy Spirit performs it as you are praying. So all that the Holy Spirit does really is to establish the will of God. He's not here to perform anybody's word except the word of God. Even angels, don't, they listen only to the word of God because all, everything is subject to, to the authority of God that is in the kingdom of God. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, or we read this one before. Now, Ephesians 1, 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So you see, he works all things according to the counsel of his will. First John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have desired of him. If we ask according to his will, we have that confidence he will hear. So if we don't pray, we don't generate that power. If we don't pray, we don't generate that power, that power that the Bible says the power of the righteous generates the power of the Spirit. And when the Spirit is not, the power is not generated, the Spirit will not do anything. That's why the Bible says you don't have because you don't ask. So you see that prayer and the Word, when the Spirit and the, when the, spirit and the Word meet, miracles take place. So you must understand the need to pray. It's important that you pray and generate that, that power of the Spirit of God by your prayer. And then it's important that you speak the word of God in your prayer so that how it, as it happened at Genesis 1, it will happen. The Bible said it will always happen like that, that if you pray according to his will, you have this confidence. You have this confidence. That whatsoever you have prayed, which is according to his will, which is his word coming as you are stirring and generating the power of the Holy Spirit, will be, will be materialized. Prayer is not measured in multitude of words or your physical exertion of energy. It's not in physical. This is prayer really. Is a, it's mainly really spiritual exercise. Matthew 6, 7. When you pray, there is no need to repeat empty phrases. Brethren, let's stop all of these things. Repeating empty phrases, praying like the Gentiles do, for they expect God to hear them because of their many words, because they, sp- they spent hours. It was Wigglesworth who said, they said, I can get something in 10 minutes from God by faith than shouting at him all night. It's not how long. Repeating the same thing all over and over. It's not how long. It is not measured by how long, but how well and how scriptural. Because the scripture, the word of God guides us in everything. It's, it's the lamp onto our path. So it's not how long. The confidence we have is not on how long. The confidence we have in prayer doesn't come from how, how long. It comes from his will that we prayed. That's where the confidence comes from. His will, praying as the scripture has instructed. That's where the confidence comes from. It doesn't come from how much you yelled or shouted or how long a sleepless night you've incurred. It is only measured by faith. James 1.7 For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the law. Who is that man? The man who will not pray in faith. So it's measured by faith. If you pray and believe and doubt not, you have it. So this is what God expects of you and me when you pray. God expects you and me to make a simple request 
Don't, it's not supposed to be complicated. When we go through the prayers that people pray in the Bible, you see how simple it is. It's not complicated. Don't make it, God doesn't need complication. Just, hey, what do you want? He said to, he said to this man, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I receive my sight. As simple as that, he received. What can be, what, receiving a sight is a major miracle. Make it simple. Simple request. Not multitude of words. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing but in everything, in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests. It can't be. This is simple English. Request is what you request. Let your request be made known unto God. I want you to show me anywhere in the Bible where people came with complicated stuff. Simple request. The Jesus' mother went to him. Simple request. Simple request. Simple. Make it simple. When you get complicated, you are confused. Do you are the, that's the kind of ask, uh, um, prayer that Jesus said to this woman. He said, you don't know what you're talking about. Because there are some prayers we pray and God is saying, you really don't know what you're talking about. Number two is learn to argue your case. Christians don't know that you need to argue your case before God. And I'm going to spend time here because to so many people, they don't know this. They've never seen it, but it's all over the Bible. You make your request and argue your case. Make your case. Remind him his words, his promises. That will be your most powerful argument before God. Make your case. Why you must have it. Prayer, God wants you to come and make your case. This request here, make your case. Let me hear. Isaiah 43, 26. Put me in remembrance and remind me of your merits. Let us plead and argue together. Set forth your case, child of God, that you may be justified. Prove right. Set forth your case. When I prayed for my sister, I said to the Lord, she, just, she doesn't know this thing in detail. She just got to start. She's just beginning to know this thing. I'm making my case. She, if she had known it, then she'd be responsible for herself. But she just began to learn this thing, Lord. She doesn't know. I started making my case. So, Lord, I, I, I'm going, I need to do something. Teach me what to do. You make your case. He said, let us plead, <laughs> argue together, set forth your case. Why should God do it? Let's see examples about how to pray and how to argue your case before God. Matthew 6, 12. Jesus himself was talking to the Father. See how he made his case. And forgive us our debts. Why? As we forgive <laughs> others. He began to make his case. He said, when you pray, make your case. Lord, do this because of this. Starting, and lead us in, in, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why? For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory. He said, you have the ability, you have the power, you have the glory. So you, he was making his case. He said, make your case. Acts 4.23 is powerful. How? The early church knew this things, and they didn't have they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and did all this. They didn't have all these things, books, all this part of the Bible have now. But they read it in the Old Testament. Come, let us plead together, and they learned you have to make your case. In Acts four twenty three, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. Verse twenty four. When they had the report, all the believers lifted up their voices together in prayers to God. Now, let's see what they said. Let's see what they prayed. They said, O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago. They began to make their case and say, God, you said this thing. You said it. 
He said, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant saying, why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare to, for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. They say, Lord, you said it. It's happening according to what you said. They are stating a case here. Solid case. Verse 27. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod, Antipas, Pontius, Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. <laughs> they are making a very powerful argument here. Who you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. See the cases I'm making here. Your will determined all these things, Lord. It's happening right now. And because your will determined it, this is what we are requesting now. Verse 29. And now, O oh Lord, here are their traits. We made a case. You said this thing. Ago. It's your will that determined these things now. Now, here, he said, and, and now, oh Lord, here they are threats. And give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook up. The anointing and the word collided. It's always like that. They brought forth the word of God. They brought forth the will of God. They established it before heaven. And as they were saying, they were generating the power, the tremendous power available. They were generating that power. The power and the word collided. The Holy Spirit had no other option than to perform it. So I watch over my word to perform it. He, he had the word. They had the case they made. Lord, you, you, your will determined all these things. You said it through your servant David. They quoted Psalm, the book of Psalm, and said it's happening in this city. Look at the Herod. Look at this person. Look at this person. Now, Lord, because of this foregoing, which you established, anoint us to go out there and preach your word in the midst of all of this. And the Spirit of God shook up this place. I mean, can you imagine? The, the, and how long was this prayer? If you time it, not complicated. How long? It's not after two minutes. Oh, it's not after two minutes. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. God, with his power, man, tremendous power was released. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Let's see Elijah. Let's see Elijah even in the Old Testament. Make his case. Argue his case before God. Oh, man. You have to learn to go to God. And bring out your scriptures. Get your case ready. And go before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what you said. This is what you said. This is what you said. And this is why this has to happen. Elijah, 1 Kings 18, 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. The man was making his case. Lord, you, I did all these things at your word. Let it be known that I didn't act on my own. Prayer is about establishing your will. I didn't act on my own. He said, hear, O oh Lord, hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. See the case he's making to God. Everything is what God has said, what God has done. You've done this, Lord. You've done this, Lord. This thing I'm doing is at your word. 28, then the fire of the Lord fell. It will always happen. It will always happen. The fire of the Lord fell and comes in the burnt sacrifice. And remember that Elijah didn't pray until the prescribed time of offering sacrifice to God according to the covenant with Israel. 
and he brought the stone and put the 12 tribes of Israel, put it according to the covenant he had, because he knows that God is a God of covenant. He called him by his covenant name with Israel. He called the, 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 the fathers. Oh, gosh, oh, kappa. He called the fathers. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. Covenant-keeping God. These are your people. You have turned their heart back. Let the world know that these are your people. And you sent me here as your servant. And I did this at your word. Awesome argument led out. He had fuming finished. The Spirit of God warm, sent the fire down. Consumed the sacrifice. When Elijah went to plead that this woman wants to kill me, God brought to him, God, we can't hand over this thing. Look at a stubborn woman. We're going to see this in over, all over the place. Look at a stubborn, the woman with a stubborn faith. Please her case before the Lord. Mark 7.26. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, not even a Jew. And she besought him that he would cast for the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled now, for it is not me to take the children's bread, cast it unto the dogs. You know, people think, oh, Jesus is calling her dog. No, Jesus is not calling her dog. Because remember that God talks in these languages, metaphors, allegories. This is like a dog is usually a part of a family. So he was just using a dog to illustrate a family setting. To say in the family, you don't, a dog is part of this family, sleeps in the house, but doesn't have the same privilege as the children. I wasn't calling that woman a dog. It was just illustrating the reality that the Gentiles had not been brought into the kingdom yet. Even though they are on earth. It was when Christ died and rose that the scripture said, you Gentiles who were afar off are now drawn nigh. If anybody should be a Christian, we should be not people rushing into Christianity. Now, Verse 28, and she answered and said unto him, yes, Lord, listen to her. She's making her case. Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumb. You see her argument before the Lord. She made her case. He said, Lord, even crumb is enough. Crumb from you we hear. And look at what Jesus said. And he said unto her, for this saying, you made your case. For this saying. The things you tell God and the, God is not respect of a person. Say, well, for this thing you said, you've made your case. You can't be dealing with God in ignorance. You just cannot. That's why you need the truth. You need, to, you need to arm yourself with the truth and arm yourself with the word. God doesn't deal with ignorance. God does not deal with ignorance. Even stating your case is, is a demonstration of your confidence in God. When you bring his word and bring this, to, like this man said, even the crumb, Lord. Even the crumb. And Jesus said, you made your case for this Say him, go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Blind Bartimaeus, they want to show us this, because you got to learn how to pray. Blind Bartimaeus appealed to the mercy of God. Look at what Blind Bartimaeus did. Luke eighteen thirty-five, and it came to pass. That as he, as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, they didn't say Jesus of Nazareth. No. Very significant. He said, Thou son of David. 
he addressed Jesus by a different title. They told him, this is Jesus of Nazareth. But he said, thou son of David. You are the promised king to sit on the throne of David. You are. You have the authority. You are the promised king that God promised our father David. You are. You have the authority. And then he began to plead his case. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Because the scripture said that God delights in mercy. God prefers mercy above sacrifice. He said, I mercy, I'm pleading. You have the authority. You are the son of David. Have mercy on me. He didn't say, heal my, no. Have mercy. I'm appealing to your mercy. I'm making my case. You are the promised Messiah. You are the promised king that will sit on the throne of David. You are here. And the dead which went before rebuked him that he should hold his feet. But he cried the much, so much the more. So what happened? Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood. Man, think of it. The crowd. Remember the crowd that followed Jesus? One man brought Jesus the standstill. He stood. Something must have happened that was different. The Son of God stood still. Stopped. Somebody made his case among the crowd. They called him Jesus of Nazareth. He called him the Son of David. They have mercy on me. God will never deny mercy to anybody. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought to him, unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What will thou that I should do unto thee? What do you want? You want mercy? What mercy? And he said, Lord, that time I received my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Because receive thy sight, thy faith has saved thee. That confidence in me. And immediately he received his sight. It works all the time. Plead your case. Take your scriptures. Jesus said, let my word dwell richly in you. Then ask. Use it. Make your case. Ask. But you know, if you go before God with this unbelief, anything that is of the flesh, don't make your case with anything of the flesh. It's a waste of time. Remember, when, when Elijah went to make his case before God, he said, I'm the only one. He said, ah. He said, all these people... God says, stop that kind of thing. He said, I reserved them. I reserved them. 7,000. Then he went to God to talk about it. He said, this woman wants to kill me. God said, my friend, hand over this ministry to somebody else. There was no power falling, nothing. Because what he was pleading was not God's word. Most of the time we go to God, we, we, because we don't know, we, we just think we go there and be talking anyhow. Some people go and be accusing God. Angry with God. <laughs> he won't bring any power. The Holy Spirit won't perform anything. Go there and be, you know, bring emotions and be complaining. That's not what the Holy Spirit will perform. You don't have a good argument. Your case is so bad. It's unbelief. You don't enter with evil heart of unbelief. You are, it's over. He won't listen to you. Hebrews 3.12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's what we will do to you. Go there and be complaining and compiling what this person did to you. All these fresh things is useless. All this, this person, you know, Lord, it's a long time. <laughs> it's a long time. But he must have been blind for a long time, too. He didn't say to Jesus, you know, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, it's a long time I've been here. He won't listen to him. You go with full assurance of faith in his word and bring your case. Lord, you said, you said this, you said this, you said this, that's why I'm here. I'm your child. I have a covenant with you. This thing is my portion. This healing is my portion. That's why it's my portion. 
God said, yeah, that's yours. Take it. Yeah, Lord, I receive it in Jesus' name. You need to prove to God that you really need his intervention. Because sometimes we, we are not serious. We, we, we pray as if there's option. You, you, have, you must show God there is no option. Either he intervenes or there's no other option. Blind Bartimaeus gave no chance. He gave, the things tried to dissuade him. He shouted the more. Jesus saw this man really, really meant business. Sometimes little things discourage us. Little things we just give up. Just like that. That man had the crowd shouting at him to shut up. He shouted. One man against the crowd. You got to show God that except you do this, nobody else. It's called supplication. That's what the word supplication means. Heartfelt seeking. The word supplication is used more times than the word intercession. Intercession in the New Testament. Heartfelt seeking. You, you, don't, you don't pray as if, as if uh, well, whatever. Lord, whatever. And then you get whatever. Deuteronomy 4.29. But if from hence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God with, thou shalt find him if thou seek him with all thy heart with all thy soul. That's the proper attitude. Many don't have it because they have plan B. They have plan B, plan C. Then God will expect you to receive from him, to act in faith, exercise your faith. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving. Supplication with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the language of receiving. The language of receiving. When you pray, God will expect you to trust him and believe him that you have it. Now, how do I know when God answers my prayer? The answer is right here in the scriptures. In uh, Philippians 4, 7. And God's peace shall be yours. Philippians 4, 7. Read it amplified. And God's peace shall be yours. That tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. That peace which translates all understanding. That peace which passes all understanding. You can't, you, can't, you can't attribute it to what you see. You can't. That peace is of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit. It is through his peace. So the word of peace, they don't know. He leads us through the word of peace. It is through that peace that guards your heart, that the Holy Spirit stamps into your spirit without witnessing that all is well. You don't, you, that peace doesn't come from what you see. But we disregard all those things and insist on walking by sight and destroy everything. And you keep on asking, when do I know? When do I know? Yet you are the one that walked yourself into confusion. Because the spirit will give you assurance, but it won't be enough until you see you because Thomas. You'll be searching for, searching, look, textile, and be talking to pastor. Whether pastor will see vision small. And any visiting pastor you see, anybody, you go, start talking to them, wanting to tell the pastor, please pray for me. You, you don't know what you're doing. The Bible said, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord if he's not prepared to believe God. So the peace of God, the Bible said, that transcends all, the, transcends all understanding, shall garrison and man guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is here to guide you. His peace will assure you all is well if you will listen and depend on him and that will be sufficient for you. Because once we don't see the result immediately, oh my God, we get agitated. And the devil will take your, what you receive that way. So you've got to learn to keep it. 
God wants you to keep what he has given you. Revelation 2, 25. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Hold it fast. Hebrew 10, 22. Let us draw nigh with a true heart in full assurance of it, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that he, for he is faithful that promise. You don't have to waver. If you give thanks, don't waver. Stay with the thanksgiving. Once we don't, honestly, we pray, oh, it does, immediately we don't see it, we think it didn't happen. Maybe you need to read about Abraham too and find that the man was giving thanks for many years. Faith and patience are inseparable. If you don't want to exercise patience, you don't, you, you're not working in faith. Faith and patience are inseparable. Hebrews 6, 11. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will c- come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull. See what people who are spiritually dull do? And indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance, faith and patience. That the King James Version says, faith and patience. So faith and patience walk hand in hand. Now let's take the part two of this thing that we are looking at now. That is asking in faith, which is indispensable. And that's why many people falter. Let's look at James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we notice how the scripture teaches us how to get our prayers answered. For instance, James starts off in verse 6, talking about um, verse 5. If any man, if you lack wisdom, he started off talking about wisdom. Then he said, let that man ask in faith. Then he now went on in verse 7 and told us that that's how you get everything, not only wisdom. In verse 7, he said, that's how you now get everything. For let not, man, let not that man suppose he will receive anything. He started off by talking about wisdom, ended up telling us, okay, this is how it works for anything. So he says, let him ask in faith with no doubts. Let him ask in faith with no doubts. Can you say it with me? Let him ask in faith with no doubts. What is doubt? To be uncertain about something. And in this case, to be uncertain of the answer. Why are you trying to see it? Be uncertain. Because things have not changed. To believe is, it is to believe it is unlikely to happen. That is doubt. To believe it's unlikely to happen. Having no confidence in a person. In this case, God and his word. That is what doubt means. To believe this thing is unlikely to happen. Why? I have not seen anything. No sign that's in his work. In short, the things are not changing. So you see, it's unlikely to happen. Uncertain about the answer. That's doubt. The Bible says, let him ask in faith with no doubt. And Jesus explained the importance of asking with no doubt. In Mark eleven twenty two, and Jesus answered and said unto them, have faith in God. In other words, don't doubt God. Verse 23, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. If, if you believe that you receive them, it shall be yours. If you, if you do not believe that you receive them, it shall not be yours. Why? Because you have no confidence in what you are saying, that it will come to pass. That's what he started to say in verse 
23. For verily I say unto you that whatsoever, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt. He is not uncertain about whether it will happen. Shall not doubt. He, he, he doesn't believe it's unlikely for it to happen. No, no. He is certain this thing will happen. Shall not doubt in his heart. But shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass. He shall have whatever he said. He said, therefore too, when you pray. The same thing, when you pray. When you say, you shall not doubt that it will happen. He said, if you don't doubt, then it will also happen. He started from verse 23. To explain that when you say something and you don't doubt, you don't have, you don't, you are not, you are certain it will happen. You say it will happen. He said, when you pray, it is the same principle. Therefore, 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 is connecting what I said before and now. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire now, when you pray, when you say, when you talk, believe that you receive them. Don't doubt and you shall then have them. The converse is also true. If you don't believe that you receive them, you shall not have them. And in verse 7, what we read in James chapter 1, verse 7, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So don't let that man think he will get anything from the Lord because he is doubt. Shall not doubt. Shall not doubt. And if you don't doubt, then your action will show that you don't doubt. Hannah, 1 Samuel 1, 12. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now see this prayer, there's no shouting there. Then it didn't, it's not how long. Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. Did you believe this kind of prayer? God also answers it. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drinking. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away that wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out that is supplication, seeking with all her heart, seeking with all her heart. I have poured out my soul. Before the Lord. This is supplication. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Bela, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken thereto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way see what faith looks like. The woman went her way and did it and her countenance was no more sad. She believed it. Her attitude, faith is action. If she didn't believe it, she would go home and stay be complaining. Her countenance was no more sad. Acts 14, 8. And there sat a certain man in Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The, the same had Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, perceived that he had faith to be healed. And then Paul says something, said with a love was, if, if you are healed, do what healed people do. Why are you sitting there? You believe you are healed. Do what people do. What you ask yourself, what I'm doing, is that what I should have done if I, if I got this? Thing? If I say I'm healed, what I'm doing, is that what I should have done if I didn't have this sickness? That's how you judge this thing. What I'm seeing, is that what I should have said if I really actually received this? Thing? Paul said, if you, if you believe you are healed, do what healed people do. People who are healed, who are healed of cripple walk. He says, stand upright on thy feet. Now, that's what people who are healed do. And he lived and walked because he believed. Then, the scripture reveals the reason why many people don't believe God. In verse 8, James 1, James 1, 
verse 8. He reveals the name, verse 8. He says, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is why many people do not believe the word of God. The Bible says they are double-minded people. What is double-minded? Look at some translation. In this one, basic English Bible says, for there is a division in his mind. In his mind, he is uncertain in all his ways. All his ways, not just prayer. Now, a double-minded man is inconsistent in all his ways. That is double rim Bible translation. This is Webster Bible. A man unsettled in his opinions is unstable in all his ways. In all his ways, in not just prayer. What this reveals is that this inability to believe God in prayer reveals a deeper problem in the life of that person. A major issue. Why, what makes him unstable in all his ways? Not just prayer. Not just prayer. His mind is carnal. His mind is totally carnal. That's why it's unstable. Not spiritual. Such a person has a deeper problem that, that meets the eye. They depend on their feeling and what they see and hear, which, which changes like t- temperature. They do not depend on the word of God, which is stable. They have carnal minds. That's why they are unstable in spiritual things. They depend on what they see, what they hear. They are not spirit people. They are ruled by their emotions, ruled by their feelings, ruled by their senses. So if, there, if things feel this way, they change. They are stable in all their ways, not just prayer. In anything they do, they are ruled by their feelings, ruled by their emotions. Anything they do, they are, they are carnal-minded people, unstable in all their ways because what is guiding them is not stable. It's feeling, it's emotion, it's human wisdom, it's human reasoning, which comes to zero. Somebody says, such a one is a man of two minds. If someone is torn between two ways of life, then they will be changing their ways based on how they feel at the moment. So his ways are unstable since they're consistently changing. That's the problem. He has no confidence in God. And his word. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 14. So you see why Christians don't exercise faith. He says this man can't receive from God. This man cannot receive anything. He's unstable in all his ways. He's talking about the carnal mind. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man, the unspiritual man, does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts. See? Why did James said he can't receive anything. Anything. James started by wisdom and ended up with anything. Now, this is what the scripture already said in 1 Corinthians 2 4. But the natural, the non spirit man, the carnal man, does not accept, can't receive anything, and welcome, admit into his heart the gifts, teachings, and revelations of the Spirit of God. For they are folly, meaningless, because it doesn't, it's not in his comfort zone. He doesn't reason out, doesn't see. Meaningless and nonsense to him. He is, an in, he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually, only spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. But he, but he is a carnal minded person. He cannot receive anything. James said, Let that, the carnal man cannot receive anything from God. Brethren, or, or if you are carnally minded, you will not receive anything. I don't care what you are doing. That's what the Bible is, is teaching. That will tell you why many people are their prayer don't work not. Let me show you his action. Second Kings five eight. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent his message, message, this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored. I will be healed 
of your leprosy, the carnal man, the word of God is not sufficient. He has to see something. There has to be some physical something. He lives in the physical. Then verse 11. The name man became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me. See, physical. That's where they live. He said, I expected him. Human reasoning. That's what guides them. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. This is what I expected. This thing is talking. Go. Jesus said, I have done this for you. What are you talking about? I need something physical. I need to see. And the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, the Paphras, better than any of the rivers in Israel. Human reasoning, human reasoning will block you. Receive anything. 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 Are they not better than any rivers of Israel? Why should I wash in them and be pure? So the man turned and went away in a rage. But this officer tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it now? Because grace is simple. It's simple. Because Jesus did everything and said, come and take. Oh, no. Now, if God had told us to do something more difficult, maybe we would be comfortable. God says, ask according to my will. Be confident. You, I'll hear you. You get what? No, so simple. So I have to spend three hours, shout and yell, and call pastor on the phone, textile, tell him about it. Kana. That's the problem. That's the issue. Unless it's solved, you see nothing. He says, so, so, so you should certainly obey him when he says simply go and wash and be cured. So Nehemiah went down to the Jordan River, dipped himself seven times. As the man of God had instructed him, as God had told us in the grace in this gospel, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. The solution, there are three parts solution to this kind of minded me that will solve your pro- pro- prayer problem. These three things will solve your prayer problems. If your mind is not spiritual, your prayer will be affected. Or you think because you quote scripture, you teach scripture, you preach scripture, you know it. Can I people preach? Can I people quote? But when it comes to doing, they falter. Look at what the scripture says. James 1.22. But be you doers of the word, not hearers only, not preachers only, not talkers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoever who looketh into this, the perfect law of liberty and continued therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Brethren, if you have no respect for the word of God, and you hear and they are preaching the word and you are not practicing your faith, you are not practicing by responding to the word of God, you will be carnal, completely deceiving yourself. Prayer will work. Carnal-minded people, they look down on the word of God. Period. Luke eleven twenty seven, And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd Raise her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb, womb that body you, bore you, and the breast which nursed you. But he said, No, no, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and act on it and keep it. Matthew 12, 49. And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother, my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. You want to become spiritually minded? You start practicing to do what the, what the Bible has instructed you to do. That's why you start. But if you look down on the word of God, 
you're already in trouble. Your pride, all that carnality, your prayer will work. It won't. Hey, you're unstable. Peter. So we need to learn to meditate on scriptures. Joshua 1.8, and don't be a, a, don't for a minute, let this book of Revelation be out of your mind. Out of your mind. Don't let it be out of mind. Ponder, meditate on it day and night, making sure you are practicing everything written in it. Making sure you are practicing. Then you will be, get where you are going. Then you will succeed. Making sure you are practicing. Meditate, meditate, meditate. It's not just talk, talk. Making sure you are Practicing your faith. Practicing. Practicing. Do it. If they say forgive, make sure you do it. If they say stop lying, stop lying. Make sure you practice it. Proverbs 420. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart for they bring life. Yeah, they change people from carnal mindedness to spiritual mindedness to those who find them and heal into their whole body. So guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Carnal minded people. James said, let, the, let them not think they shall receive anything. They are unstable. What they are relying upon is spiritually worthless. The flesh. To profit nothing, even in prayer. To renew your mind and become spiritual is one thing you owe yourself. Otherwise, the Bible says you are deceiving your own self. That's the worst type of deceit when somebody is deceiving himself. You will receive nothing of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you give you praise for what you have challenged us with. That issue is carnal mindedness. We bring it even to prayer. Unstable in everything else. We have no respect for your word. We don't even intend to. We don't even intend to do them anyway. Because we are okay. And we deceive ourselves. You helped us You've told us the truth. It's bitter, but when we know it, it sets us free. Our prayers ought to work, Lord. Because those that believe you ought to walk as you walked. As you walked. Help us, Lord, to understand these things. And readjust ourselves. We owe it to ourselves to grow out of carnality. For God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in his revealed truth. Thank you, merciful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hello, church. Thank you for joining us for this week's Bible study. Please join us again next Thursday by visiting live.ftlw.org. You can also visit our YouTube page to live stream our sermons or to catch up on sermons that you may have missed. On Sundays, service starts at 10.30 a.m. Due to the new procedures that have been implemented upon entering the church, those attending in person should arrive at 10 a.m. If you gave your life to our Lord Jesus Christ during this live broadcast or any of our live broadcasts, we are rejoicing with you because the Bible says that the angel of the Lord rejoices when one sinner repents. Please call us at 973-675-6558 and we'll be glad to help. Also, if you need information about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or need prayers, please call us at 973-675-6558 and we would love to hear from you. Finally, if you were blessed by this teaching, please hit the like button below, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thank you, and remain blessed. Let's pray about the offering. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege to give. We lift up every offering and tithe before you. We ask, Lord, that you receive the gifts and the tithe of your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let me dismiss us now.
Now may the God who brought us peace by raising from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ so that he would be the great shepherd of his flock and by the power of the blood of the eternal covenant may he walk perfection into every part of you giving you all that you need to fulfill your destiny and may he express through you all that is excellent and pleasing to him through your life union with Jesus the anointed one who is to receive all glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Let's share surely now. Surely shall follow me all the days of my life. Thou shalt dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.